You might want to take a copy of the scriptures and turn to Song of Songs, chapter 5. And we'll be there in a few minutes. About every five years or so, I bring this book out and I tell you that you should read it. It's C.S. Lewis's book called Paralandra. C.S. Lewis is very hard to read when he writes philosophy and theology and that kind of prose. But when he writes stories, they're very gripping and he tells very good uh, theology and philosophy in his stories. And so this is probably one of the only novels I have that actually has a lot of, I mark this one up. I mark other nonfiction books up, but this is probably one of the only fiction ones I do. It's, it's a textbook in, in the theology of uh, men and women and human beings. Well, in this story, it's an Adam and Eve story that takes place on another planet, the next planet over, the planet Venus. And there's a fellow who's a Cambridge scholar who uh, finds his way to the next planet over, takes a ride before they had spaceships. He wrote this in 1944. It's really quite prescient. He's speaking right into our day today still. It's quite amazing. And this Adam and Eve story happens in this this fellow named Ransom, who teaches at Cambridge, comes to this place. He finds this woman who is uh, the Eve of the Adam and Eve, and he hasn't met Adam yet, and he finds that she is being tempted to disobey the only rule that God has given them. And so he goes through, the book is about his struggle with the tempter, um, you know, I'll, I'll you know, wreck the story for you. He, he does win the battle against the tempter. And he is bruised and beaten. And finally, uh, at the end of the story, he sees this couple together. They are together and all the creatures on this planet, all the animals have come and have bowed down to this king and queen of this new creation. So let me read you a paragraph uh, as we start. There was great silence on the mountaintop, and Ransom had also, also had fallen down before the human pair. When at last he raised his eyes from the four blessed feet of this Adam and Eve, he found himself involuntarily speaking, though his voice was broken and his eyes dimmed with tears. Do not move away. Do not raise me up, he said. I have never seen, I have never before seen a man or a woman. I have lived all my life among the shadows and broken images. Oh, my father and my mother, my lord and my lady, do not move, do not answer me yet. My own father and mother, Adam and Eve, I have never seen. Take me for your son. We have been alone in my world for a great long time. And so he sees this young couple who has come through the temptation and not succumbed as our father and mother did. And he is shocked and amazed seeing what God intended. He was absolutely awestruck. And he knows that he cannot have this, even though he says to them, take me for your son. He knows he cannot have this now, not yet. There is always a danger that the good and beautiful things that God gives us will make us envious when we cannot have them. If, if God gives something to someone else, it can make us envious. Eve in the garden saw that the snake, and she saw that God had wisdom, and she was envious. And she wanted that wisdom, and that's why she gave in to the temptation. And so our message today is simple. Love what is good, even though it is not ours yet. 
God uses good and beautiful to bring all of us up. Paul says in Philippians 4.8, Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I was in the Air Force for a decade, a long time ago now, and their motto was, aim high. And the idea is that you're never going to hit anything higher than what you aim. So if you aim low, you're going to hit low. So aim high. And that is, in some senses, a biblical principle. And so our text that we've been reading, Song of Songs, aims high. It's about a man and a woman coming together, and it is, as Paul has said, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. And in some ways, when I read it, it makes me think about Genesis 2, uh, where Adam and Eve had not yet fallen uh, into temptation, fallen for the temptation. And it seems to me somewhat like a verbalization, what they would have said to one another, perhaps, in that garden. Just as the Psalms tell us what David was thinking when he was doing all the things, when he was hiding from from King Saul, the Psalms tell us his mind. And so, uh, Song of Songs strikes me that way. It is good and it is beautiful. There are parts of Song of Songs that in our culture and time seem too intense to read out loud to one another. Uh, and they are written in a particular time and place. They are written in uh, a Middle Eastern, tribal, ancient culture. And so we will treat this text as it is. It is the Bible, it is the Word of God, but it is also the Bible's art. And so um, it's colorful, it's spicy. Again, Middle Eastern, tribal, ancient, it's not our world. But it's still heard today, this kind of poetry in some corners. And some of the meeting places for it is in the, actually in the Arabic world. Uh, there were Jewish communities. They're called Mizraki Jewish people. Uh, there were Jewish communities in Baghdad since the time of the exile, 500 years before Jesus. Uh, communities there in, in, in uh, Damascus, in Cairo, Amman, uh, Rabat, all those cities. And those Jewish communities, most of those people had Arabic as their first language. And so uh, that poetic tradition continues on in the Hebrew and in the uh, uh, Arabic world. And so I, I've asked our friends, uh, Nasima and Ramsey, in a few minutes, they're going to come up and read a couple of sections for us out of their Arabic Bible. And so that we get uh, the intonation and the feeling of a first language and sort of like background music. And uh, if, if you want, when we're doing that, you can read the passage in your own first language. And what that will also do is give the uh, married couple in Song of Songs a little privacy, if you will. So let me lead us up to uh, the place where they will read for us. We're at chapter 5 and verse 2, and basically it's this. These two have their first conflict. Um, the man comes in and he approaches the woman uh, to have relations with her again. And she basically says, it's kind of inconvenient, really. And then she changes her mind and she looks in verse 6 and says, I opened up to my lover, but my lover had departed. He was gone. My soul went out to him when he spoke. I searched for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. And then she talks about running around the city at night again. So it's kind of a repeat of that sort of nightmare scene from chapter 1, where she's looking for him in the city at night. Now, 
we slip back and forth between literal and metaphor in this book all the time. And the speakers, uh, the man and the woman, have set the metaphor for us. I mean, they've, they've told us that the, uh, she said, I, I didn't, I'm not taking care of my own vineyard, and she means her body. And so very often, gardens and orchards are about bodies and body parts, and body places and, and relationships and all that sort of thing. And so we're never quite sure where we are in the literal story, but one thing is certain, is that there is a conflict. And you have two people with two minds and two hearts that are becoming one person, one flesh. And so both of them have to decide which is more important. Is my will more important or my relationship? Is it me and you or is it us? Do I have to get what I want so that everything is fair and just? Or should I focus on what is good and beautiful? Should I give up the gift I have, this good and beautiful thing, this oneness, should I give that up in order to have what I cannot get? And what I cannot get is having my way and the oneness at the same time. Can't have it all. So they decide, rightly so, they both decide that what they have together is worth far more than having things their own way. And so uh, the passages that we're going to have read for us now as Ramsey and Nasima come on up, they're going to read for us. They're going to tell you the chapter and verse they're in, uh, and you can read along in English if you want, and we'll enjoy uh, their Arabic intonations uh, as these two uh, in the story come back together after their conflict. Just tell where you started. Yeah. Good morning. If you don't mind opening the Bible to Song of Songs, chapter 5, I'm going to start reading from verse 10. Is this better? Okay. When you're ready, let me know. Ready? Okay. So, chapter 5, verse 10. This is the beloved now, Al Mahbubatu. حبيبي متألق وأحمر علم بين عشرة آلاف رأسه ذهب خالص وغدائره متموجة حالكة السواد كلون الغراب عيناه حمامتان عند مجاري المياه مغسولتان مستقرتان في موضعهما خداه كخميلة طيب تفوحان عطرا شفتاه كالسوسن تقطران مرا شليا يداه حلقتان من ذهب مدورتان ومرصعتان بالزبرجد وجسمه عاج مصقول مغشا بالياقوت الازرق ساقاه عمودار خام قائمتان على قاعدتين من ذهب نقي طلعته كلبنان كأبها أشجار الأرز فمه عذب وكله مشتهيات هذا هو حبيبي وهذا هو خليلي يا بناتي أورشليما بنات أورشليما أين ذهب حبيبك حبيبك أيتها الجميلة بين النساء إلى أين تحول حبيبك فنبحث عنه معك المحبوبة قد انطلق حبيبي إلى جنته إلى خمائل الأطياب ليرعى في الروضات ويقطف السوسنة أنا لحبيبي وحبيبي لي وهو يرعى بين السوسن Seven one through seven nine. Ma ashaka khatawat khatawati qadamayki bil hidaiya bintal amiri, 
فخذاك المستديرتان كجوهرتين صاغتهما يد صانع حاذق سرتك كأس مدورة لا تحتاج إلى خمرة ممزوجة وبطنك كومة حنطة مسيجة بالسوسن نهداك خشفتي دبية توأمين عنقك كبرج من عاجي عيناك كبرتك حشبون عند باب بث الربيم أنفك كبرج لبنان المشرف على دمشق رأسك كالكرميل وغدائر شعرك المتهدل كأرجوان قد وقع الملك أسير هذه الخصل ما أجملك أيتها الحبيبة وما ألذك بالمسرات قامت هذه مثل النخلة I'm sorry. قامتك هذه مثل النخلة ونهداك مثل العناقيد قلت لأصعدن إلى النخلة وأمسكتن بعذوقها فيكون لي نهداك كعناقيد الكرم وعبير أنفاسك كأريج التفاح فمك كأجود الخمر If there's any words you didn't understand, I'll be happy to translate them later. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> I could feel the breezes off the Mediterranean already. It's great. <laughs> the two come back together. And she says to him, uh, Ramsey just read verses 1 through 10 of chapter 7, and she says to him in verse 11, I am my lover's, I am my lover's, and his desire is for me. And so this poem, reflecting God's intention in Genesis 2, where it says that a man will leave his mother and father and hold on to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So we have this ideal. We have this uh, intention from God, what we called last week the rule. Now, when the scholars came to Jesus and they asked him about the exceptions to the rule, they said, well, can I divorce my wife for any reason I, I like? And they were wanting to know, because Moses said if we just give a, 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 you know, a certificate of divorce that we could do that. And Jesus answered him and said, Moses gave you divorce laws because of the hardness of your heart. He gave it to you because there is sin. But his intention was from the beginning, Jesus said. And he sent them right back to Genesis 2 with the man and the woman coming together and being one flesh. They were asking about exceptions to the rule and the truth is, is that all of the law is about exceptions to the rule. Jesus taught us on the, on the Sermon on the Mount, and you've heard it said, thus and so, but I tell you. And he drove us back to God's intention. God's intention was that we love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind, and that we love one another as we love ourselves. That's the intention, and that the, captures the whole law. And so he sent the scholars back to the rule, back to the intention. The rule, though, is intimidating. It's impossible. Adam and Eve couldn't do it. They were out of the, gar or out of the garden within the next chapter. Life is complicated, and our Bible... Our scripture, the word of God, recognizes how complicated it is. And that's what the message of the law is. It's what's the message of the prophets. It's the message of wisdom. It's the message of the gospel. God knows where we are. And he wants to direct us back to the intention, the guiding, and the starting principle the reference point. So Solomon, let's talk about him. Let's, let's back away from our text 
in Song of Songs just a little bit and talk about Solomon. He wrote three books in the Bible. He wrote the Song of Songs, which I am taking as probably his earliest writing because it says in there that his mother put a wreath on his head uh, as the bridegroom for his wedding day. Um, I can't imagine that she did that for all those hundreds of wives he took later. She, he would have worked her to the bone doing that. He wrote Song of Solomon, and then he writes Proverbs, and he writes Proverbs to his son, to his, his children. And he tells them about what they ought to watch out for, even though he really knows that it's, it's a thing that's wrecking his life. And then finally, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. In his older, uh, later years, he writes what all this means. So he, he, in the book of Proverbs, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll mention again so, so we remember, there are three women that Solomon talks about, and he knows all three of these women. The Proverbs 31 woman at the very end of the book is about his uh, great, great grandmother, Ruth. And he tells his son, when you go to find a wife, find a wife like Ruth. It's impossible. Aim high. He knows the woman wisdom. He believes in wisdom. He is the wisest man on the earth. He's asked the Lord for wisdom. And wisdom is personified as a woman in the book of Proverbs, in chapters 8 and 9. And she was there at the creation when God was, was creating everything. And Solomon tells his son, hang out with this woman. Take tea at her house. It's impossible. Foolishness is bound up in our hearts from the time we're born. And it's our parents' job to sort of drive it out of us. It's impossible to be wise in every situation. All the decisions that I made before that are affecting my life now, it's very hard. It's a very high standard. And finally, the woman he talks about uh, in chapter 5 is one he calls the foreign woman. And he says... She wants everything you got, and you should stay far away from her. And I think he's saying this out of personal experience. He's got apartment buildings full of wives, deals he's made with other kings in other places. And so he knows this, this deal to ship, you know, whatever it is into his country will be good because he's married to the guy's daughter who's, who's shipping the goods to him. It was a very practical thing in the world. But these foreign women, all these wives he had, took away from Solomon the pure joy that he writes about in Song of Solomon. He recognizes what he has done. He, tried to t he took God's gift and he tried to replicate it himself. If once is good, 500 is great, right? I'm king, I'm wealthy, I'm powerful, I can do what I like. Very much like Eve was with the Lord. She was envious that the Lord and the snake both had wisdom and she didn't. And then in the next chapter, of chapter uh, 4, after, after the temptation and they're thrown out of the garden, she's going to have a baby. And she has a son and she names him Cain. And it means to get, to grab hold of, to acquire. And if you read it carefully and read all the way to the end of the chapter, you'll see that she's, she's doing the same thing. I wanted wisdom, and now look what I've done. I've made a man just like the Lord created a man. Mm, I can do this myself. That is deeply rooted in us. Deeply rooted. And so Solomon writes to his son in Proverbs chapter 5. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, especially because you went and found one like Ruth. Rejoice in the, wife, in the wife of your youth. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, why would you want to be intoxicated with another man's wife or a wayward woman? 
Your ways are in full view of the Lord, says Solomon, who knows that he's under the microscope now. And Solomon writes later in Ecclesiastes, looking back, and what he says is that it's never been better. I've acquired so much wealth and so much power. The wisest man on earth, people come to visit me because they want to hear what I have to say. They come to see all the amazing amount of gold and silver I've acquired. And he says it's never been any better than it was at that simple Genesis 2 experience that I wrote about in Song of Solomon, doing it right the first time. And so after all the success you could imagine, and he lists it out in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says this in chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes to anyone who just thinks they got to have all that Solomon had. He says, go, eat your bread with gladness, drink your wine with a merry heart, live joyously with the wife whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, because it is going by. He's saying, I wish I had done that. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your strength. He sounds a little down. Yeah, I think he is. He tried to, to better what God had given him, and he couldn't. And what he found out in the end, see, at the beginning, there's this hope. If you read the book of, of uh, First Kings, there's this incredible hope through the first 10 chapters that this guy, he's following. This is the promised son of David from 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is him. Look at him. He built the temple and God filled the temple. Is he the anointed king of Israel? Well, yes, he is, but is he the capital M, uh, Messiah of Israel. Messiah means anointed one. Every king was a Messiah. And by the end of his life, you know, nope, he's not the one, and he knows it too. So he says in the end, work hard, play hard, do it God's way, and be grateful for the gift that God has given you. Now Jesus said something very like this. Luke chapter 11, verse 27. A certain woman in the crowd, raising her voice, said to him, Oh, blessed is the womb that carried you and the breast that nursed you. In other words, she's saying, I wish I was your mother. She's so lucky. But he said, on the contrary, or rather, dear lady, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. In other words, don't envy what's not given to you. Rejoice in what you have. And what you have is that the Son of God, the Messiah, is here, so follow him. Now, we all have our story. You probably know mine and more about it than you want to, but... I'll tell it anyway, because I know it best. In 1936, my father's parents split up, divorced when he was three. And so he had to grow up without a father. He was so annoyed and vexed by all this, by a stepfather. By the time he was 16, he, he got his mother to sign him into the United States Navy during the Korean War. And by the time 1966, 30 years later, rolled around, I was 10 years old and I lost him in the Vietnam War. And by the 10 years later, I was 20 and I felt like I had excuse and cause to be angry. And I did that for 10 years as a young husband and father. And God spoke to me when I was 30, and I had two kids and a wife, and he said, you cannot get the past back. You can't have life the way you wanted it to be. You can only move forward and let me create future for you. You need to turn your eyes upon Jesus again. That's what he told me. 
Hear the word of God and obey it. And believe me, when you make a mess out of your life, it takes a while to get yourself turned around, to see beauty again, to see goodness, to see righteousness. And so at the age of 30, I decided to follow Jesus again in my brokenness as I was and to build a family with reference to Genesis 2 and Song of Solomon. Even though I can't have perfect anything, I'm going to keep that as my reference point, what it's supposed to look like. And that's what he gives us. And so Jesus is the firstborn. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And many in our age look at that with envy. I don't want Jesus. I want to be Adam and Eve. We have the technology. We can be our own tree of life. We can stay alive longer and longer. We can make our own Tower of Babel. We can talk to anybody in any language anytime we want. We want that. And God tells us you cannot have, you cannot be in the garden again until that day. We will see the tree of life again, his people. We will see the tree of life in the new Jerusalem. That will be something, to be face to face with the Lord, but we're just not quite ready for it yet. He's growing us up. And so God takes us in as his children. And do you know how he does that? Paul tells us in Romans that in Christ, we all become the children of God through adoption. Isn't that great? If you are in Christ, you are adopted. And that is great news. And so for this broken world that we live in, Will you accept the gift that God has given you, that he's giving us, the gift to be his child, to live with reference to all the things that we can't quite put our hands on, we can't be in heaven, we can't see it, but it's there, and we're living our life in reference to it, in rhythm and time with it. So will you say yes to that? That's what it comes to. Let's pray.